So in particular, what really set the stage for water systems, not only in Michigan, in our Saginaw in particular, but throughout the country were a series of tragic events involving fires. Um, in 1871, there was a, a very large fire in a community called Pestigo. And then there was also a number of fires uh, related at the same time, October 8th, 1871 is when these all occurred. What happened is they were in a very severe drought condition and that was combined with a southwest strong wind. And then because of people, you know, burning something, the fires then spread. And one in particular you probably know about is uh, City of Chicago's fire. That was part of that event. There were 250 dead. The Pestigo fire was by far, by far, uh, much more serious. There, it was reported that, it, and it's a very round or a large figure, between 1,200 and 2,400 people died in the Pestigo fire. The important part and the reason that it's called the Pestigo fire is the community of Pestigo, Pestigo which is right up here, um, was in, it was a lumbering town in the middle of woods. Um, 800 died. That was half their population. What happened was uh, everything was made of wood, okay? All of their structures, the boardwalks, there was sawdust in the streets from the mill, lumber mills, um, and they were surrounded by woods. So there really wasn't anywhere they could go. They were trapped in an inferno, basically. Um, some of them jumped into the river trying to survive of those. Um, some of them boiled to death in the river, it was so hot. There were sections of the river that actually were dried from evaporation due to the heat. Just a terrible, terrible fire. So that really set the stage for people to start thinking, man, we really need to do something about fire protection. And to be honest, most people don't even think of that that much anymore, but that's a big part of it. There was also another fire in 1881 called the Great Thumb Fire. That was much more related to us. Um, if you look at this picture here, and right up in this area, this whole clear area, not the hatch, but the clear, that all burnt. And it was actually noted that there were some, uh, in the early uh, lumbering days, that more lumber was lost to fire than was actually harvested because of the practices they were using and the, uh, the effects of that. So again, and I'm going to read to you some statements out of the papers of the time. This is, this is related to the 1881. The drought all over the Mississippi Valley and throughout the Northwest continues with unabated, unabated rigor. Atmosphere scorches and blisters everything. Vegetation dried to a cinder gives nothing but material for fire. Trees shedding their leaves a month before the usual time. Grass brown and withered. Pastures and streams dried up. Milk scarce. Butter a, lux a luxury. If it does not rain and rain hard soon, food will be scarce this winter. Buyers paying the unheard of price 18 to 20 cents a pound of butter. Boy, what did I do for that right now? <laughs> uh, quote quote um, uh, immediately for Saginaw. Intensely warm and smoke suffocating. East of the city, forest fires raging fiercely. Hundreds of acres of fire. Fires plainly visible from the city at night. And then this next quote I also think is important. This is Friday, September 9th. The worst ever. 31 townships and 11 villages swept by flames. 45 bodies found in New Paris and Sandlot County. Fire started in northwest, northwest part of Sandlot County and in adjoining Huron County from settlers burning to clear land. Spreading east and north to the lake shore, then west through Huron County, then south and southwest, then east to cross Cass River, where it met another part of the fire and raged for 12 hours. 500 to 600 dead, 2,000 families homeless, 15,000 destitute. Okay, so these things are what set the stage for having modern water supplies as well as the need for clean drinking water. Okay, but a big part of what we do is to prevent fires. Um, so what happened is, um, at that time there were two cities. There was an East, East Saginaw City and a West Saginaw City. And, um, and respectively, the west side in 1872 and the east side in 1873 constructed pump stations for the purpose of fire protection. They pumped raw water, well, water right out of the river. It wasn't raw water because they didn't do anything with it. They just pumped water for fire protection, okay? Um, when they built the two, um, I believe, let's see here, I got some notes on it. 
Um, this also happened because of a lot of smaller fires that happened throughout the city of Saginaw with the lumber mills and so on that were here that they dealt with on a regular basis. Um, the uh, west side Saginaw uh, station was at the corner of Hancock and Niagara. Um, by 1885, they had 12 mains of high pressure water main that had been built and by 1951, there were 51 miles in place. East Saginaw appointed a five person water commission in 1873 and in 1874, they built a pump station and that was near the Naval Reserve site on a 10 acre parcel purchased for the city. Um, it was constructed and by 1915, 74 miles of water main were, were constructed. So this is just a picture of what the pumps looked like. The pumps of that time were not electrically powered, they were steam powered pumps. Uh, similar to what the boats, you know, steam boats as we refer to them, uh, similar technology, a large piston drive and flywheel, a lot of oiling going on, um, very, very specialized equipment for the time. The original, in this particular case, this Holly pump system uh, was originally a two million gallon per day pump. They then added a four million gallon per day pump. Uh, for a total of six. Eventually those steam driven pumps were replaced with two electric pumps, each with a three million gallon per day capacity in 1919. And as I said, those pumps pumped river water primarily for fire protection. From our records, I know that we also, that there were residents connected to these raw water lines, but obviously, at least hopefully, they weren't drinking it. Um, <clears throat> what were people were using were corner pumps, and we'll talk about that. This is some water main examples. They used what was available to them at the time in great supply, which they had a lot of wood. Um, and I was just talking to my assistant superintendent who worked his way up through the ranks, and he said recently, as within the last few years, he's come across these lines. Now, as far as we know, none of them are still in service, but they're still out there, and when we excavate, we run into them. He said that there was one line that he was trying to move with his, with his uh, uh, backhoe and he couldn't move it, you know, just kind of push it to the side. That's how strong these were. Um, these wood lines <coughs> were very uh, excellent material. You know, you're not going to get a whole lot of contaminants out of it. It hold, as long as it's wet, it's going to hold up and not, and not rot. You know, the material was a very good material, but we don't have enough of it to use. Uh, they also used cast iron uh, and they used riveted steel in those days. So, <coughs> Until the time that we built the plant that's currently in service now, and it went into service in 29, the corner pumps were what supplied drinking water to the community. There were 151 of them. Um, I was able to find this picture of a young lady uh, filling up her bucket. Um, I actually remember as a child, I grew up in Essexville, Bay City area. I remember going with my grandfather because he didn't trust the city's water system. We would go to the corner pump. He had racks that he built out of wood, plywood, that held four gallons a piece, and we had a funnel, and I'd help him haul the bottles back and forth from the trunk of the car to the pump, and he, that's what they used for drinking water that my grandfather did. So I have personal experience with this, although not in Saginaw in particular. Um, so anyway, what happened was at some point it was determined, you know what, our city's growing too much. We really, really do not have the capacity for drinking water that we need for our community for people to survive. So at that time, and I got up here a map which is going to be hard for you to see, but at that time in, in the early 1900s, Here's the river. Lake Linton is a, a, a much bigger lake than what we have today. Um, and I don't know exactly how, but I believe it was connected to the river or we connected it on the other end. But what it really is is an old oxbow lake. You know, as rivers um, make meandering paths, over time it'll short circuit itself across that path and create a lake. That's how Lake Linton was formed. What they did is adapted that lake to a water supply, and that's today. So this is where Lake Linton is, and this would be where the plant is today. <clears throat> and I'll show you in some pictures to come, but they actually separated that lake during the process of constructing the plant. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, the professional term we use is potable water. Basically means you can drink it and not be sick, okay, or won't make you sick. Water that contains or does not contain objectionable pollution, contamination, minerals, or infective agents and is considered safe for human consumption. So in order to make waters potable, and in this case I'm going to talk to you about surface waters that, um, that we are currently using that the plant would use at the time was river, eventually the lake. 
Uh, you have to remove the suspended particles. Any harmful particles must be destroyed, like bacteria that would create um, disease, that kind of thing, pathogens we call them. Um, so that can be done through chlorination, but we have a process called complete treatment, and it combines settling, which is the, the particles made larger and settle out, um, filtration, which actually filters the smaller particles out that we can't settle out, and then chlorination, which kills any infective materials that are not uh, removed by other processes. So it's considered a multi-barrier approach against disease-causing organisms. So it is designed for the purpose of turning surface water into a potable water or drinkable water. What I'm going to do now is show you, I guess you guys really like pictures, so I got a bunch of them here. I don't know how well you can see them, but um, I'm gonna have to point and I did this so that I could get enough pictures into the presentation without taking a ton of time. But I show you this because of the um, practices that were used when they built the plant. Um, you can see a horse right up in here, steam shovel back there, cable driven steam shovel. Um, over here you can see some of the forms that they were using and the material they used. They actually used air, air driven hammers to cut the clay into the forms that they needed for uh, foundations. Here you can see the material storage. Most everything was delivered by rail car. Here you can see sand delivered to the site by rail car. And if you look in the background here, this is Ezra Rust. There's actually fill covering these trees. They didn't even take the trees out first. They just pushed the fill all around it and created the roadway that is now Ezra Rust and separated the lake one side to the other in order to create that impoundment that they needed for the plant. I really like this. <laughs> Today you may have seen they have pumper trucks. They pour concrete in the back of the truck in a hopper and then there's a piston apparatus, apparatus that pushes the concrete through hose and piping to get where they need it. What they did is they had a concrete hopper on a crane. They made the cement at the bottom or the concrete at the bottom, put it in the hopper, raised it up to an elevation that would provide the head that they needed and then chutes on cables transferred that concrete to where they needed it to be. So, also very manual. In this case, we've got a smaller mixer. I'm sure it was in a, you know, a smaller location, maybe a little more remote. It's basically a tired mixer, very large size mixer, but you can see the bags there. They're doing that all by hand. Uh, here's another picture. You can see the shovels. Here's the air hammer I'm talking about. Here's the foreman basically telling them to get going. Um, so, you know, it's just amazing stuff. You take a look at this over here. I don't know if well you can see it. Their scaffolding was literally patched together from, spray, um, from wood that they had. It, uh, they'd never fly today, I can tell you right now. Some more pictures of concrete being poured. Most of these are the pump station that I've shown you so far when it was being built. Again, a large steam shovel, cable driven steam shovel. Some of you guys may remember Mike and the steam shovel, that little book that you know, I remember that well from when I was a kid. Um, that's one of the uh, generator bases for the Fulton diesel generators that were backup power when the plant was originally built. Those generators lasted from 1929 until 1980. The thing that was neat about them, how many of you remember the old fashioned uh, tractors, the uh, John Deere's, the chuck, 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 chuck? They were low RPM, but high torque. They were able to produce a lot of power and they weren't nearly as loud as the new generators. I tell you what, they'll deafen you. But anyway, the only reason they replaced them was because they started to throw parts. You know, it got dangerous. But um, they were pretty amazing. This is uh, a picture of the crane that's in the pump station that allows us to do maintenance on the plant as time goes by. I show you this, this is a view of the lake, so you can see the lake in there, you can actually see it was connected to the river. Um, they put an intake in that lake and they were treating river water directly out of that lake. Um, this, is, this is a picture before construction, to excavation basically of the clarifiers and the flocculation basins. Um, that's part of the settling process I was describing. Here's another picture, these are the, uh, let me see if I get this right, yeah, these are the flocculation basins and the clarifiers are here. Here you can see the backside from the Rust Avenue view, here's the wash water tower and this is some of the cast iron um, 36 inch line that was used to uh, transport water through the site. 
Um, the reason that that wash water tank is important is that's what's used to backwash the filters when they get dirty. Okay, so after we filter so much water and so many of those particles are removed, uh, we can tell based on the time that they've been in service and then what we call head loss. As those filters get dirty, uh, the pressure on the top gets greater and the pressure on the bottom of the filter gets less. That's why we call it head loss. When it gets to a certain point, we know we need to wash the filter so we don't push that dirt right through the bottom. Okay. Uh, again, this is the flocculators and the clarifiers. The settling basin is in the back. That's where most of those particles are removed by settling. This is the filter gallery roof. This is the men taking uh, concrete panels and laying them onto the beams to create the roof. If you've been in the plant, if you've seen it, when you walk through the filter gallery, if you look up, it looks like, it looks like wood. It's stained concrete. Those panels you can see from below and they're stained to look like wood. More of the filters, uh, wash water tank, a little better view. I included these because I thought it was really interesting. This is basically a dry mix. You can see a tank right here. This is similar in the way it functions to what the asphalt pavers are today that we see. This is a concrete paver, and over here you can see the truck dumping the dry mix in. You can see these cables, this chute, I'm imagining all of this, I don't, I'm no professional on this and I didn't see him work, but it looks to me like this cable would then lift this up, it would dump it into a hopper, it would be mixed with water, and they'd push it out the front. And then these guys out here are moving it around, screeding it and doing the necessary work to make a roadway out of it. I think that's really interesting stuff. This is a way that you can see the dimensional lumber on the forms. You can see the concrete and all those little stripes. They use two by material and maybe some one by depending on how strong uh, or how heavy the concrete was. But they formed, there was no plywood in those days. It was all dimensional lumber. Can you imagine doing that to form these huge structures that we have? Amazing. Uh, right here, these are columns. This is a settling basin. These columns support the roof. You know, you have to support it. Um, so that's where the, a lot of the material is removed from settling. This is a picture of the uh, reservoir, uh, the finished water reservoir, which we use, you know, when it's completed, we put our finished water in it and then pump it to you for home. The reason I included this, and this goes back to my geotechnical background, that's called a slump test. We still use that test today to tell if concrete is uh, one of the things we look at to tell if concrete is properly made. And to tell you the truth, by today's standards, that's not very good. That looks like about a seven or eight inch slump, which is cow pie. Now, I'm assuming that the reason that they did that was to get that stuff to flow. Okay, but I can tell you from experience, I don't know what they did in those mixes, but they were pretty impressive because this concrete that we have is much better than the stuff we have today. Uh, we, when we did our master planning a few years back and we did inspections of the two clear wells, the old clear well is in much better shape than the new clear well that was built in the 60s. More pictures of that. This shows you where the, you know, the actual, it looks like a big stadium. If you get inside of it and look, it looks exactly like a stadium. These are the columns that I was describing to you. And from the looks of that, looks to me like they formed this all up. This part is rebar. Looks to me like they formed this all up and poured it in contiguous pores. Now that's amazing. Now I don't know, they couldn't have done all of that at once because they couldn't create that much concrete. But they had to have segmented it and poured um, because those columns are all part of the roof and the way that's formed up. So it's pretty interesting construction practice. This is the filter gallery in the administration building. Here's some more of that concrete chute. See it? The reason I have these pictures is um, the family, the, the man that was foreman for the construction company had taken most of these pictures and had them at home. And his granddaughter, back in about 2005, came to the plant and with all these pictures, not just these, but many, many more, and said, would you like to have these pictures? My grandfather passed away and we don't need them. You talk about a wonderful gift for us to be able to see and appreciate. I'm assuming this was my, uh, what I used to do, except many years ago, as a technician basically testing the, contract, uh, the materials for construction. A um, couple men out in, uh, I believe that's during some flooding on the river. 
uh, in a float boat. And then I think, I'm not sure, but I believe this might be that foreman. He's testing the slump of the concrete at that time. Um, you can see it's pretty cold. Uh, the reason I included this, you, if you could see it closer, that's some of that riveted steel pipe. Some of you may be aware we had to remove some of that in 2013 and 14 and replace it because it started to leak. Um, it's literally bent plates of steel that they then riveted along the edges to create a pipe. Um, it's probably, I'd say, a quarter to three-eighths inch thick, and once you start to get corrosion, it doesn't take long for a pit to get all the way through that. So we have more of it. We have some coming out of what we call the uh, court discharge. The Washington discharge is the one we worked on, and there's also a 60-inch version of that that goes between the gatehouse and the settling basin. So we're a little bit concerned about the condition of those, and we're doing some investigations into that. More pictures of the wash water tank. I show you that because again, this is riveted steel construction. They did not have the technology we have today. It was much more difficult to construct these things than, than what we do today. When you can weld it, it's much smoother than when you got a, hundreds and thousands of rivets to, to heat up and imply. Um, this is the collection system for the clarifier. Those also have sludge collection in them and basically they're big paddles that push the sludge to the middle and sent to the sewer. This shows you some of the architectural limestone that was cut for the facility. Um, in this picture, there's wash water troughs visible. What happens is when we backwash the filters, we drain them down to the top of these wash water troughs. We isolate, well actually before that, we isolate the filter from the process. We then push water backwards through that media, it's sand and anthracite, and that pushes the dirt out of it. And we actually, we suspend the media, we make it liquid-like. We put enough force through it that it actually floats. And then that dirt and so on comes off. It's collected in those troughs and goes to the sewer. And then when we're done, we take the flow back down, reverse the process and fill it with water, and when we need it, we start to filter again. This is some of the piping associated with that process that allows the backwashing and filtration to begin. And the other picture there is just a picture of the facility as it's nearing completion. This is the laying of the cornerstone. I love those hats. I'd like to have one. Those are pretty cool, those top hats. Um, it's not real visible because the scan didn't do very well for me on this, but there's Boy Scouts in this picture that you can see. I think there's a um, like couple up here and there's one over in here somewhere. But up in there, those guys are standing in the window of the men's bathroom. <laughs> All right, this is a more finished picture. Uh, that's the filter gallery as it's getting closer. These are actually radiators that they installed for heat. This is what the original um, filtration gallery looked at, liked. These two dials up here, one is for uh, backwash water rate, and the other one is for the tank level in the backwash tank. By the way, there's some gentlemen here from Tetratech, which is the most recent iteration of the company that built this facility, designed and built it. And I appreciate they, they're here. There's, I don't know the one gentleman's name. There's Vic Cooper Wasser and Gary Markstrom and your, your name, sir? James Christopher. James Christopher. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, so anyway, as we move on here, there's a picture of the finished plant. One thing I want you to note, and you can't see it as well as you will be able to later, the original walkway was not as it is today. It was actually a big rectangle, and you had to walk up the sides and then come over and into the facility. Um, it was not a direct walkway. I told you about the company. The name of the company originally was Hode, Decker, Showcraft, or Shoecraft, and Drury. Okay, that was the original architectural engineering firm for the plant. The architect's name was Victor A. Matson, which originally is from Chicago. Um, the information I had is um, he was a member of the American Institute of Architects and American Waterworks Association, as I described earlier. Uh, he had accumulated 20 years of experience before he desi designing water plants before he designed ours. Um, uh, he, he loved beauty as, and it was well known. And this is a quote directly from him. And this also goes to my mind to the fact that we've kind of lost our civic pride. You know, everybody's more worried about how much money we spend than what we can do as a, as a group, the kinds of things that we can accomplish. If you look throughout the country and you look at things that were built between the 1880s and the 1940s or 50s, civic pride was huge. People were just amazed at what they could accomplish together.
And I'm not saying that our approach is all wrong, it's just that it would be nice if we had a little more civic pride in terms of what we create together. But this is what he says. The matter of good and bad design is a question of knowledge, ability, and opportunity on the part of the designer, and knowledge on the part of the critic. Indirectly, it is economic to give the public beautiful as well as useful things, especially when one considers that all of the money expended on a complete water system, only about 25% of the total is applied to works above ground and visible. That's very true. There's a whole lot of this. We're talking mainly about treatment, right? There's a lot of pipe out there. Um, there's a millions and millions of dollars in pipe. Um, that's also part of this water system. So let's talk a little bit about the situation I was describing before with rivers and how difficult they are to treat. Rivers are generally very poor quality for surface water. If you're going to treat surface water, rivers are the most challenging there is. It's very difficult, it's susceptible, very dramatic and rapid changes. Um, and when I say that, I can give an example. I, when I first started, she said I worked for Bay City. I was an operator. Our intakes weren't out that far into the, into the bay. Uh, I think it was about, one was a mile out, which is the original intake, and the second intake was three miles out. But the river plume under certain wind conditions could blow right over the top of the intake. And we call it turbidity, but particles in the water, it'd go from relatively clean, 25 to 30 uh, parts uh, uh, NTU, we call it, which is not like your drinking water, it's less than 0.5 in terms of your drinking water. Uh, actually less than 0.1 most of the time. But uh, anyway, to go from relatively clear to mud, like two and 300 NTU, in a matter of 15 minutes, the water coming in. So, you know, that kind of change is difficult to deal with, especially if you're trying to chlorinate it and so on. Um, so, it's difficult to treat. They're susceptible to runoff from sewer industry and roadways. And then plankton and algae. So, Great Lakes, um, they provide some of the best quality surface water in the world. It's more consistent because of the sheer volume of the Great Lakes, and also, it doesn't take that far offshore to get a fairly deep intake. Our intakes are in 30 to 50 feet of water, the two intakes that we have. And the deeper they are, the better water you typically get. And the, the difference between, or the reason for the difference in, in uh, depth has to do with our ability to get water. If we're having trouble with a particular level, we can switch to the other intake and possibly get better water. And we do that at time to time. So some of the problems with Great Lakes, you can have thermal upsets, um, river discharges, which I described before. In our intake that we currently have now, it's not as big of a deal because it's more of a diluted river water. We don't have a river that the plume blows over the intake, uh, also due to the depth. Algae and plankton. But the biggest thing is what we call turnover. And that happens in a in combination between wind and thermal inclines that occur in the lake. And what will happen is the surface waters are warm and the algae and stuff will eat up all, all the food up there, right? Um, well, what will happen is they'll get to the point where there's not that many algae because they've eaten most of the food. Well, if you get a turnover event where you get a wind direction across the surface and it turns that water that used to be down deeper to the top, there's all kinds of new nutrient there and the algae will bloom and create problems for us to be able to treat it, okay? So compared to a river though, it's a cakewalk. <coughs> So this brings me to the fact that what happened was during the uh, early 1900s they decided, you know what, our city's too big. We need to have more drinking water available for the people. So they built that water plant. Then <clears throat> after they built it, what happened is because they could, they could treat the water effectively and it made it safe to drink, at least by the standards of the day, the river water, it still smade, it smelled and tasted bad. They couldn't remove all of that. So a lot of people were continuing to use those pumps. And of course those corner pumps were getting older and older, right? So that combined with the fact that there was industry in the area that was interested in better water quality, discussions began about building a pipeline. Now, <clears throat> There were more cities in Saginaw and Midland that were offered to participate in this. Bay City was one of them. I even believe Flint was one of them. 
um, that were offered the opportunity to participate in the pipeline. But it ended up that City of Saginaw and Midland were the ones that moved forward. They both had local sources, river sources that were poor water quality. They also had groundwater that was very poor in the area. Dow in Midland County has a lot of salt in their water, okay, besides the treatment that they do there and whatever. And then you talk about ours, we get a lot of salt and hydrogen sulfide in our groundwater and it's very hard. So, you know, we, we take it for granted now that we've had this water this long, but people suffered with the water that they had in those days. So the cities joined together and formed the Saginaw Midland Municipal Water Supply in 1946. They actually passed a special law through the legislature that allowed that to happen. It was a very, uh, what would I call it? Um, for, they had a lot of forethought to it. They really did some great things here. It was called a partnership for, partnership for the common good, which I believe has become true. The ownership was based on the amount of that water supply, which the original was 43 million gallons for that raw water line. The anticipated use by each city determined what their ownership was. Our ownership remains the same today. City of Saginaw has slightly more ownership than the city of Midland. Whitestone Point was chosen. Um, I believe the city of Saginaw had some representatives um, along with uh, Midland and I believe some of those were representatives from Dow including their scientists and engineers. They did a very good job of picking our location for our pipeline. Um, it was in a location where the depths of Lake Huron were good and it also is an area where, I don't know how familiar you are with the currents in, in Lake Huron, but Lake Superior feeds Lake Huron, right? Well, that Lake Superior water tends to track down the shoreline and reaches down to the up, what's called the outer bay and it kind of swirls there and then goes up around the thumb and down. Well, this intake is actually partially in that. Okay, so we're, it's not all Lake Superior water, but a good portion of it under the right conditions is Lake Superior water. It's uh, eight miles north of Augre and roughly 65 miles from each city and provides us very good water. This is the original intake. I know exactly where that site is. It's near the old Etna cement plant in Essexville. There was a, a maintenance garage just north of the plant. They launched that there and pulled it out into the lake with a tug. If you look here, you can see these gaps. Those gaps are not the intake. Those are for ballast stone. They floated out where they wanted it and then controlling the amount of stone into those areas, they literally placed it exactly where they wanted it. it the construction practices they used were amazing. It was 60 feet wide and 20 feet deep. It protects our intakes from damage, uh, from ice and from navigational hazards like anchors, things like that. The actual intake is right here. The original plant had a maximum capacity of uh, pump station 43 million gallons per day. There were 48 miles of concrete pipeline in the original line, one intake and two pumping facilities that was Whitestone Point and Junction. The cost at that time of that portion of that was $10.3 million. I don't know for sure, but I think our plant was about $6 million when we built it back in the 20s. Okay, so it just tells you how the prices keep getting higher and higher. Present day, maximum capacity is 150, 115 million gallons per day. Estimated cost to duplicate is about $600 million. I think that's questionable. And the reason I say that, the Karagandi pipeline, now this, this is, this is second-hand knowledge, so I didn't investigate this. But I'm told that with the pipeline and the new plant they're building for Genesee County, it's about $600 million. All right, uh, this is hard to read, but there's basically now two, Huron, uh, two Lake Huron intakes, the original and an additional. We also added parallel line that allows us to have much more redundancy. Every six or seven miles, there's a connecting line between the two, so if we have a break, we can bypass around it um, to help us make sure we have raw water. There are three pumping facilities. They added a pin conning pumping station. Uh, that was for hydraulic capacity. Um, what happens is as you pump more and more water, the energy it takes to force the water through the existing pipeline increases, okay, because it just doesn't want to push that hard. So your electrical costs go up. When we built the second parallel line, we no longer needed the pump stations other than Whitestone, and it paid for itself within a matter of a few years because of the electrical cost savings.
There are computerized and manual control systems there, and they do chlorinate, both at the intake and for the pipeline. The reason they chlorinate at the intake is to kill zebra mussels so it doesn't plug up the intake, and the reason we chlorinate the pipeline, if you don't, slime growth will happen in the pipeline and it basically won't function properly. Greatly increase your, what we call friction losses, which is the pressure to get through the pipe. This is a view of the pipeline, 72 and 48 inch. The two intakes are a 66 and a 72. The parallel lines come all the way down to junction where it separates, it's uh, near Midland Road and two mile and, or no, three mile and Bay City. Here's the Whitestone pump station when it was being built. This was in the 40s. It went into place, into uh, function in 48. This is how important this all was to the community at the time. They literally had a horse-drawn hearse there, and you'll see it in a second. There's a casket here. One of the corner pumps is in the casket. These are Boy Scouts. These are neighborhood boys with paper hats. This, I don't know that we have the world's best water, but we like to think so. I believe those are council members acting as pallbearers for the pump. <laughs> these, are, these are records we had. This is not from that foreman. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look here, up there, there's three nuns following the procession. There's a nun here. There's a clergyman here. They literally had a burial for this pump. <laughs> and it really speaks to me as to how how we do, and I'm not trying to be, I mean, I'm just as bad as anybody else, but we've had all these wonderful things for so long and we forget what the, what the beautiful thing is that our forefathers did for us. Here's the, here's the lake, you can see how nice that is? If, if, I had a, if I could show you the other side, it'd be dingy green. That's what the river water looks like. This is the article from the time that that raw water line went into service in 1948. And it does say, Lake Huron water rushed toward Saginaw Midland today, but the new water won't flow from kitchen taps for at least a couple days. That's, it takes about two, late, two days for the water to get to us. And depending on where you live, another day or two to get to you. Okay, so they're talking about getting that nice water coming out of their taps. This is actually from a digital uh, project that we did to digitize our maps and our um, prints for the plant. But it's got a nice little view here of the history of the plant and its grounds. In 1926 was when we started construction. It was completed in 29. In 1958 and 59, there was construction of a filter backwash reclamation system, which we don't use anymore because we found that's not a good idea. What happens is when you take that backwash water and you save it and then you reintroduce it to the process, you're concentrating the bad stuff you removed. So the chances of it coming through the system are increased. We do, we do not use that. Um, there is a sludge removal system was added to the settling basin. Prior to that time, they hosed those basins out. It's important that you clean those basins out regularly. If you don't, you can get anaerobic conditions. Does anybody know what that means? No oxygen, right. It's septic. It smells just like a sewer. Now, how would you like having that coming out of your tap? <laughs> So it's important to keep it clean, and that greatly reduced the amount of maintenance that was required, you know, the manual part of cleaning it. Another high service pump was added, and they in installed a 30-inch bypass line from the riser to the gatehouse. All right, in the 60s, there was a 10 million gallon reservoir added, so that's 20. The original was 10. So there's two 10 million gallon finished water treatment reservoirs, or uh, storage reservoirs. In 67, there was construction of filtration addition, six filters and associated piping. Most of those were added because of industry and population increase, as well as bringing on wholesale customer communities. In 1988, we added a 48-inch uh, second raw water supply line. That basically is from uh, Houghton Avenue to the plant, where we have um, more redundancy there. Um, that's from when they built those filters. It was a $1.7 million project in the 60s when they did all of that. This is the Cotchville site. Um, that site was, um, well, the envision, what was envisioned at the time is there was projections of great population increase in the northwest section of Saginaw County. Um, and it was anticipated that we'd need upwards of 70 million gallons per day treatment capacity. Um, so the thought was, well, this plant's getting old, let's build a new plant. And they were gonna build a new plant there. In fact, if any of you knew Dave Love, 
he was a resident of Saginaw for many years. He was also the superintendent for many years. Um, he was actually hired to man that new treatment plant. Never happened. What happened is due to the economic downturn at the time, if you remember the late 70s, early 80s, uh, similar to what we saw in 2008, um, that never happened. What they ended up doing though was for added redundancy for our raw water supply, they added two 90 million gallon uh, raw water reservoirs and a raw water pump station and the rest of the plans were shelved. The prints, all the plans were completed. I think even some of the specifications had been completed, but it was shelved, okay? We're now at a point where we may need to start looking at it again, but we're investigating that very closely, okay? This plan is nearing 100 years old. You know, we're in uh, 2016, and this is, they started in 1926. I'm showing you this, there's a lot of art and architecture to the facility. This is a montage created during the 1979 50th anniversary. Uh, he was commissioned to draw, make pen and ink drawings of uh, the architectural elements that are on the facility. So these are just some drawings of actual limestone castings that are on the plant. These are some other drawings he did. That's showing the riser. Um, the riser is where the plant, the water arrives to the plant. As the water uh, moves through the plant, it's by gravity. It's pumped to the riser, but from that point it's gravity until we get to the finished water reservoirs and then we pump it to you. Okay, and then this is the filter gallery up there. This is another local artist. Um, we, didn't, we weren't aware of him until a few years ago. His uh, daughter brought in one of his drawings, or a number of his drawings, and basically asked us, would you like to have these? What he did, his name was Jake Deal. First initials were PH. Uh, Jake must be like a, I don't know, nickname or something. But anyway, um, he started drawing to ni during 1941. He has been a resident of Saginaw since 1940. Uh, they raised four children in the area. Um, he was a salesman. He, at this time in, in 2011, he was 91 years old. Uh, we received these in 2012. He was still alive at that time. I don't know if he is now. But he did a nice job, you know, of drawing. He actually made Christmas cards and sent them to relatives and friends of his drawings like this. So the local artist that, you know, you can see the wreath here from our Christmas celebration, right? These are in the foyer of the plant. Um, this, these drawings were done, and I've got some notes on that. His name was William Jan von Shipman. Um, he, these were presented or donated to the city at a council meeting of 1920, September 27, 1976, for the 157th anniversary of the signing of the treaty at Saginaw with the Indians. This is a depiction of General Lewis Cass, and one of, he was one of the heroes of 1812 and governor of the Michigan Territory at the time. He also served as superintendent of Indian Affairs for the fe federal government. He was only 36 years old and he was here negotiating these contracts with the Indians. And uh, at the time, I don't know if this ever came to fruition, but at the time the Indians were to be moved west beyond the Mississippi after this occurred. So this is a painting that was drawn specifically for the plant. This is another one by the same gentleman. Um, this is a representation of the convergence of, I believe, the Titabuasi, the Cass, and what was then a different stream, but it's now the wall drain. Um, but it's uh, Henley Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, Evangeline. And it actually was depicting um, uh, something that happened in this area. So another historical artifact in the plant. This was originally uh, drawn, painted actually, in um, when the plant was built, specifically for the plant. It's called the Approach of Winter. Uh, we named it that. The artist never named it. it if you look at it, uh, it's kind of ominous. You know, dark storm clouds in the background. I think that's why they called it the Approach of Winter. Uh, but that's showing the you know the big wheel carts that used to haul the lumber around and oxen. Um, so pretty historic stuff. Now we're to the point of current day, and I didn't put every single project that we've done since I've been here, but I've added a few of the projects we've done over the last few years, basically since about 2003 or so on. Uh, the original fluoride feed system, we add fluoride to the water and some people don't like it, but the fluoride is added to the water for uh, dental uh, reasons and also strengthens your, your bones. What happens is if you feed it in the right amount, fluoride, well, the matrix of that, um, 
uh, material or that crystalline form will work into your bones and it strengthens it, it makes it a stronger bone, okay, if in the right level. If you go over the right level, you know, it's just like anything else, too much water will kill us, right? So it's how you use it and how much of it you use. Chlorine's the same thing. Is it a toxin? Absolutely. Is it necessary? Absolutely. If we didn't have chlorine in our water, we'd all be sick. There'd be, be lots of death. You know, so there are things that, that are important that we need to do. So anyway, this is um, a tank that we put in in replacement of an old system that was all powdered fluoride. That was called sodium, sodium silica fluoride. This liquid form is hydrofluosilicic acid. Okay, and it is approved by um, the Water Works Association as well as NSF for use in water. Okay, it has to be. Every chemical that we add to the water has to be approved for water use because we consume it. Okay, so these chemicals can't be just any old chemical. They have to be highly purified and be exactly what we say they are with no impurities in them. Okay, so uh, it's an important factor. But this is a, a bulk tank that we built. We also added a day tank and a pumping system to, um, uh, and a delivery point. Um, this right here is a containment. If that tank were to leak, you need one and a half times its volume to hold it. It is, one thing I'll tell you about um, acid, the fluoride acid is a very strong acid. If it comes in contact with concrete, it'll eat it right now. It foams furiously. It's called effervescence. But that, um, that would damage our plant. We even did double wall piping on the outside of the plant so that the pipe wouldn't leak and damage the exterior. That is all limestone pretty much. Limestone and sandstone brick. The mortar is a combination of limestone and sand, isn't it, Gary, if I remember right? They did not use cement in the mortar. It was an older process, and that's partly why I got to do the masonry project that we're doing um, in the next year. They used the wrong mortar, and it, it held the water inside the facility, and it's starting to damage the plant when they did the mortar, um, the tuck pointing and so on in the 90s of the plant. Solar bees, this was primarily for the Cotsville Reservoir and these pictures are out there. What these are is it's a recirculation mechanism. It take, remember I talked about stratification of the layers in the water? It takes the um, water down toward the bottom and we actually test it to determine where the thermocline is. We take that draft tube, which is right here, kind of like a long, remember those tubes you used to crawl through years ago in the 60s they had for kids? It's very much like that. It's rings with a cloth and it just extends down into the reservoir to the level that you want it, just below that incline. And then this is an impeller. It's all solar driven. This little motor turns it slowly. Uh, I forget how, what the turnover is, I don't remember now. But it moves a lot of water. So what happens is it brings water in the bottom and then spreads it across the surface of the reservoir. And once it's going long enough, it makes convection happen. So it keeps that water clean and nice. It used to look actually, because we didn't use it that much, it looked like river water up there. Uh, I may even have pictures of it. Now it looks like Lake Huron. So it's just been a huge improvement. They cost, at that time, I think they cost about twelve to $15,000 a piece. So for the improvements that we've made, it was a great investment. We did some upgrades to the Grasset Station um, related to the Hemlock Semiconductor. Um, they actually paid, Hemlock Semiconductor paid 75% of the cost. Um, and then the customers that benefited by the station provided the other 25%. Okay, so that was a big plus for us to have that happen. Um, we added all new pumps of larger capacity. We added all new switch gear. We added two backup generators. That's what these are here. So if we lose power, it'll uh, uh, we'll power that station. Um, if you're familiar with it, it's right by uh, the Titabawassee River in um, Thomas Township, just as you go over the bridge. Uh, there's a two and a half million gallon storage reservoir there for backup supply. Birch Run Pump Station, we did some new pumps and piping there uh, for their needs because their needs were increasing. We also added a backup generator for that location. That's right here. One thing that happened is consumers, and it, it, for the main plant, they still have not caused any problem with the two lines that service us. But with in, um, changes in contracts now, just like you do for water, we've got contracts with the consumers to supply us uh, electricity. Actually, in the city, we're the largest user between water and wastewater of electricity in the city. Um, 
they've changed their approach. They used to provide you redundant power feed at no extra cost. Now, when we did this station, when we improved that station, uh, actually not this one, but the uh, Cratchit station, we found that it was about a third of the cost to just buy a new generator and install it, as opposed to what they wanted to upgrade the second line. So it was well worth it. Fortified fence. Um, part of the important part of this is the reason that fence is so nice looking, besides the fact that you know we like it to look nice, um, that plan is on, it's not a historic site of its, on and of itself, but it's in a historic district. And actually the um, archeologist from the Castle Museum helped us with this project because we had to do a study to determine there were actually five known Indian mounds. They weren't grave sites, but they were like trash mounds, which could have really nice artifacts in them. So before we could do this project, we had to do a series of test pits to determine if that had been damaged. Now I showed them pictures before this happened that basically, to me, showed that they just completely disturbed that site. They weren't worried about any of that when they built the original plant. Uh, but the test sites proved out that it was the case and we, did, we were able to build this, this uh, fence. You know, it's meant to improve the security of the facility, both from vehicular attack and for other kinds of attack. Um, I'll talk more about the security project. But this was mostly paid for, I think it was a $160,000 grant. The fence was 180,000 total. That was also part why we had to do the archeological studies and all that, uh, because they had federal funding in it. But I'm thankful, I think that that fence actually improved the looks of the facility. Um, there, may, but there may be others that disagree, but I really like the looks of it. Um, by the way, Tetratech did that for us. They did a real nice job on it. Painting project, and of course this piping, you know, you gotta take care of it. You don't want it to rust up, fall apart. So we did that. Uh, this down here, it's a little dehumidifier. Um, keeps the piping from getting too wet. Leach system. When I came to work here, the, uh, the chlorine system was gaseous did not have a containment building, did not have a ventilation system, it was outside. I lost sleep over that. You know, a ton of chlorine gas can cause a lot of damage. Um, I forget that's, I might be wrong, but I think it's 250 times by volume that chlorine gas will expand and create a cloud, a toxic cloud of chlorine. So uh, I thought, why are we, why do we have this? So that was one of the things, and Kim Mason, who's my boss, felt very, very uh, uh, strongly about it too. We converted to a bleach um, disinfectant system. Those are the bulk tanks, they're about 5,000 gallons each. This is, you'll see more, but this is a conduit that we built so the uh, lines could go from the uh, bulk tanks to the day tanks uh, transfer. Uh, this is a containment system that was built around those tanks. It was actually done in an existing structure in, a, in an open bay in one of our garages. These are the day tanks, they also have containment. These are um, scales underneath the tank so we can track how much we're feeding. Remember I said how important it was to know that you're feeding the right amount of chemical? We track our weights and our, our feed rates very closely to make sure that what we're intending to feed is what we feed. You can see here they're putting the tank in through the window. This used to be where the chlorine storage area was, it's gone now. There's the delivery station, the fluoride station is the same thing. The trucks drive in here, they hook up hoses and pump it in. These are the bulk storage transfer pumps. Particularly large, I did that so that it would only take a couple minutes to transfer to the day tank. The reason I did that is from personal experience. I know how operators work. They got a lot to do. You now people might not think that, but they generally do. There's a lot to keep track of. Well, if it takes too long, they'll go walk away. I wanted this to take a short amount of time so they wouldn't walk away and leave it pumping. We also did security upgrades. Um, the fencing was part of that. We increased fencing at Gratiot Station. We also added fencing to Aqua. Uh, we added these uh, monopoles for telemetry. The reason we considered that part of security is knowing you know, cameras and things like that, knowing what's going on at the facilities. There's um, the security panel at the operations station at the plant. We can see different locations at our pump stations um, as well as around the plant. Helps us keep an eye on what's going on at our different remote sites, um, protect us from terrorism. 
That's what the security uh, entry system looks like. It's basically a camera, a speaker, and a doorbell. And then this little gray thing is for uh, an entry card or a key fob um, so that you can scan it and get in if you belong in. Um, and then this is what's on the desk of the people in the plant. Um, they can either decide, talk to you, decide whether you're going to come in or not, and then they push that little key button there. It'll open the gate or the door, whatever it happens to be. So we've greatly increased security. This is the gates at the back of the plant. Uh, Gratiot Station, we decided to add an awning. For those of you that know, the only time you really need those generators is typically when it's raining really hard and lightning and wind and, well, all that was just exposed on the outside of the building. What happens if it doesn't want to run? Then you got to go out there and stand in a storm trying to get a diesel generator to run. Just wasn't very smart, so we added this. The awning is movable. There's wheels on tracks here. You can actually slide it out to be able to do maintenance on those diesel generators if necessary. You can see there, that's the crane that was installing them. Uh, portable generator, that was, um, we paid $180,000 for that. We bought it used from the city of Wyoming. That's what this little emblem is here. Uh, it's a 2.4 megawatt diesel caterpillar generator. A new one of those is about $600,000. And it had very few hours on it. It's a very nice piece of equipment. So I was thankful that we were able to find it. Um, this is what we did. Uh, we bought the trailer mount because it was capable of 2400 volt and 4160 volt power supply. The water treatment plant is 20, uh, 2400 volt. Uh, Cotchville is 4160. So, if were something were to happen to my generators at the water plant, I could haul that generator to the plant, hook it up, we do have a station we created for it, and power the plant with it if I needed to. Okay, so it's additional redundancy to help make sure we got water when we need water. Um, so we, we build a house, uh, building to house it in, um, and it mainly is for raw water supply. What happened is during the blackouts, we figured out how important it was to have backup power. We got thinking about, well, what happens if the pipeline goes down and we can't get any water? Well, at least we have backup generation at the Cotchville site where there's 90 mil 180 million gallons of raw water, and we could keep water flowing, okay? Sometimes these things, bad things happen, they have good out outcomes, you know? figure out what we need to do differently. All right, um, this is a generator project for Reese. Basically, it's a small station. It didn't really need its own generator. They have elevated storage that would get them by for a few hours. We could haul a generator out there, hook it up, and, and power the booster station if we needed it. And by the way, most of these booster stations were added in the 70s uh, to supply water to these outlying areas as demand increased. Um, this is the aqua station. We also have a, a, a remote point that we can hook to for a um, trailer mount for there too, but we did put in one pad mount generator. Aqua pretty much provides um, water supply to just about everyone uh, north and west of Saginaw City. This is the four million gallon ground storage tank. Um, that's a backup water supply in case we lose the plant for some reason or there's a break, main break between or whatever. Um, there's four million gallons of water there. It needed painting badly, so that was what this project was. And that's it.